So thank you so much again for coming and we look forward to the talk. Uh, like Ivana said, I was a student here coming to uh, seminars at Moss Landing. Um, uh, although I'm nowhere near as tough as your DSO, Diana Stellar, I decided to go dive in places where I can wear board shorts. <clears throat> but so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some work we did for the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, it's really a pleasure to work for the Department of Defense for two reasons. First and foremost, they are a firm believer in climate change because they have something like uh, $400 billion worth of infrastructure that's threatened by climate change. Uh, the other thing that's great about Department of Defense is uh, they have a program called the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program that asks scientists to address an issue specifically for a base, but they also want you to be able to extrapolate that information out uh, for the larger scientific community. And last but not least, um, they're a firm believer of why buy one when you can pay twice as much for two. <laughs> and so it uh, gave us an opportunity to do a lot more science than we ever thought we'd be able to do. So uh, a little different from Monterey Bay are atolls, which are basically the last stage of uh, evolution of uh, oceanic island reefs. So the islands since disappeared, you basically have a circular uh, carbonate rim with a deep lagoon, um, and they're built out of corals, um, which are a lovely animal. So in the United States, uh, do, I do have the, um, due, due, due to my laser here, maybe, maybe not. Um, okay, so the U.S. has, uh, here we are, the Hawaiian Islands, basically the northern two-thirds of the Hawaiian Island chain, all the outlying islands, the entire Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of the, the <laughs> eastern two-thirds of the Federated States of Micronesia are all atolls in the U.S. Obviously, the, the rest of the Gilbert, the Phoenix, a lot of other islands are all atolls. Um, and those fall under the U.S. Department of the Interior's Office of Insular Affairs. So we at the USGS as the science wing for the Department of the Interior have uh, our supposed to help provide geoscience for them. Now, in terms of their importance, the U.S., they're very, very, very small islands, but they have a rather massive exclusive economic zone. Their actually cumulative economic zone of these is larger than the U.S. West Coast. It's actually larger than the U.S. Atlantic Coast. And it is where we get all of our tuna and a lot of our fisheries are out there. And more importantly, more recently, a lot of our deep sea strategic minerals, all those weird parts of the periodic table that you don't really know what they are, but every cell phone in the world has like three picograms of them. So um, the US law of the sea is greatly concerned with a lot of the resources out in this area. Um, so these atolls, again, very low lying. However, they have some of the highest population densities in the world. Uh, this is capital of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, Delop. This is Ebai. So this area here has 30,000 people, the highest density island in the world. Um, yet, here's a view from them, and this is not at high tide. This is low tide. So you see some of the average housing. There's the government building with about a two-meter seawall. There's their power plant for the atoll, again, with a nice seawall. And there's their airport um, which, if you're on coral list, there's been a lot of things about the dredging around to expand that. One of the interesting things you'll see here is these stains are all from seawater overwashing from the oceanic side. So why the Department of Defense cares about it is because they have some uh, installations there. Uh, if you've heard of places like Bikini and places like that, it's where most of the atomic weapons testing was done in the 40s and 50s. Um, the, which was handled out of Kwajalein. Um, Johnson, which is now a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge, is where we did most of our chemical and biological uh, weapons decommissioning. That shows some old uh, ancient orange out there. Uh, in the Marsh Wake is where they launch a lot of their test ballistic missiles, which they track into Kwajalein, uh, which is where the premier deep space radars and where they do a lot of testing their new facilities. So atolls, um, they're pretty unique and poorly understood settings, very low topography. 
maximum elevations on the seaward side. There's some, usually a dune, slight dew complex in there, maybe two or three meters. Very steep bathymetry. Um, about, so surf zones here at about a half a meter water depth. Within uh, about 100 meters off here, there's about an 80 degree slope that drops down to about 2.5 kilometers. So it puts the canyon here to shame. Um, loose sediment and bedrock. So you've got this carbonate platform. The corals break down, produce sand that's mobile on top of that. Um, and then you've got living, growing, and dying coral reefs, this entire carbonate complex, and a limited freshwater lens. And so what we mean by that is you basically have a sandy island, which is almost kind of like a barrier island. Rain falls on it, and it, freshwater being uh, less dense than saltwater, it kind of forms this lens that presses it out, and this is the primary source of water for these islands. So uh, when did these islands form? Well, during now we're looking at uh, Dickinson's 2009 paper, so time, thousands of years. So during the last glacial period, basically these things stuck out as these huge karst towers. If you think of something like things you see in southeast China, but sticking hundreds of meters out of the water. Uh, as the ice sheets melt and sea level rose ra rapidly, Basically, there was all this new Holocene accretion up into this accommodation space. So one of the things, we, didn't, we don't see this here on the US West Coast, but in the central and western Pacific, sea level was actually about one to two meters above, or higher than present, from about 5,000 to 2,000 years ago. Really interesting earth mantle dynamics. Um, and so the, most of these atoll islands and even on the high island coastal plains like Kauai or Hawaii or Fiji, um, they developed during the sea level high stand and subsequent regression. So here's a picture from Paul Kench's seminal paper. So sea level flooded over top of the top of the or over top of the carbonate platforms. Basically, you break down coral, you make sand, and you pile it up. And so sea level's higher, we made these bigger, bigger islands, and the sea level dropped. And so most of these are Holocene features. So <clears throat> sea level in the Western Pacific has been rising at about two to three times the global average, resulting in a foot of net sea level rise since 1990. Remember I said most of these islands, well, their average elevation is about two, one to two meters. So that's pretty significant. And uh, so the U.S. Cli National Climate Assessment, you know, we have sea level rise projections anywhere from 0.2 to 2 meters um, the, with large regional variability. However, one of the great quotes out of the last IPCC report talks about ice sheets. For those of you that read Science and Nature, you'll see a lot of the stuff coming out of Antarctica suggesting that these large ice sheets becoming ungrounded can break off and collapse. And thus, th where we used to think oh gosh, we're heading in this direction. Uh, a lot of the conversation now is that we're probably heading to more to higher sea level scenarios than thought just half a decade or a decade ago. So uh, this is a really weird, confusing map. Don't worry about it much, except you're seeing ISO lines of the sea level high stand during the last, uh, during the Holocene high stand. And you'll see this area, so you're seeing these areas where you're seeing like two meters or so. So this is during that mid-Holocene high stand, the elevation of those islands. And from this point here is the Marshall Islands have a high stand magnitude of about 2.4 meters. So it's one of the highest areas in the, in the Pacific where these islands formed. And so they grew, grew up into a high uh, accommodation space. And so when they're thinking, and this is basically mid-2000s projections of, gosh, you know, maybe the tide will just reflood that surface, not flood the island, just reflood the surface in maybe 2080 or 2160. So they think, okay, they've got centuries, they're good. And that's just when tide gets up to the, to the top of the carbonate platform, not when it gets over the island. So historically large waves, about every 20 or 30 years overwash these islands. You get a 
big tropical cyclone, it happens. And so it damages infrastructure, it ruins fresh water supplies because all of a sudden you put a bunch of salt water over top of that fresh water lens and it contaminates the fresh water lens. You can't drink it anymore. Uh, destroying agriculture, you've got taro fields and things like that. However, now these wave-driven overwash events are happening multiple times a decade. Well, remember we said sea level's been up about a foot in the past couple of decades. Not surprising. So basically, sea level rise is going to exacerbate those hazards. And you know, both the infrastructure, freshwater supplies, agriculture, and habitats for threatened endangered species. These are actually showing the uh, 2014 overwash event on the capital island of Majuro, uh, which I'll show you data from on Kwajalein Atoll. This was actually the 2008 overwash event in Kwajalein at our field site, which motivated DOD and us for this study. So our objectives on this were to provide basic understanding and specific information on based storm wave induced flooding and overwash. So can we advance our understanding of the, the, the physics of that, those processes, uh, assess the impacts on infrastructure and freshwater availability to determine tipping points when they're no longer valuable. And in this case, we were saying that you can have an island, you have an island, no fresh water, you don't have human habitation, unless you're gonna build desalination facilities, pull in water from somewhere, you know, bring, basically bring in water tankers or something. But we know these islands don't have a lot of large GDPs, they don't have a lot of money to pour into infrastructure, so at least some of the islands, will basically those tipping points are gonna be this time when there's no more fresh water. So some of our problems for accurate projections, well, <laughs> there's this extreme and most often unknown morphology in coral coverage. Uh, the Department of Defense has probably the deepest pockets in the US, and when they can't even fly LIDAR and mapping missions here to get the accurate information on it, you know, so we're stepping in, we've stepped in kind of blind. There's really limited field data, no empirical relationships, nor data to calibrate or validate models or try to use them to adapt them to these kind of really extreme environments. And again, it's unclear if those existing models developed for environments can work in these settings. Perfect example, every coastal model is developed based on what we call these mild slope equations. Out here, the seafloor is relatively gently sloping. So basically, these configurations violate all the physics in those models. <laughs> So the question is, can, can we adapt them? So how we want to attack this is based on all it has to go into climate change projections, when it is it gonna happen in the future. So we took some global climate models from the IPCC AR5 assessment. We use that to drive global wave models uh, no, using NOAA's Wave Watch 3. And then we use that to feed into X Beach, which is a wave and run up model developed for hurricanes along the US East and Gulf Coast. Uh, between the Dutch and uh, the U.S. Army Corps. So, okay, can we get waves up on the up onto land and look at coastal flooding? Now, on the groundwater side of things, we have the IRAM, which was University of Hawaii's dynamically downscaled regional climate model, and those both fed into SUTRA, which is a variable density groundwater flow model developed by the USGS. So, any of people who've done any groundwater have heard of mod flow. USGS standard for the past 30 years. Sutra is like it on steroids. It can basically handle variable density flow like basically salt in fresh water. So our study area was Roy Namor, uh, Kwajalein Atoll. It's part of the Ronald Reagan Ballistic Missile Test Site. Uh, why Americans care about it is because they do most of the radar development, deep space surveillance, uh, and ballistic and anti-ballistic missile testing, like the stuff that we're trying to put out into Korea right now. And um, so basically we have classified stuff here, power here, and big airfield and study area over here. So we turn this into the uh, most studied atoll in the world. A uh, bunch of instruments, oceanographic wave tide gauges across the reef flat, all these 
magenta are well clusters to, to uh, hydrogeology, um, amongst other things. So the first thing is, is we had to map this feature. Again, there's no LIDAR. Um, what we could get is DigiGlobe 2 and DigiGlobe 3 satellite imagery. And using ground truthing, you can do pseudobathymetry, which is looking at how light attenuates. And you can make kind of synthetic bathymetry. This is done by NOAA's Center for Coastal Fisheries and Habitat Research, my buddy Don Field. So here shows a model, which is calibrated through uh, 40 or 50,000 observation points. And then we had to make the island. And so, Ivana, you'll appreciate this. Here's our high-tech research vehicle here. <laughs> Here's my buddy bopping along in knee-deep water and our terrestrial LIDAR scanner. And pulling those all together when the radars aren't spinning up so much that it would fry the electronics on our systems, um, we were able to look, get kind of matching coverage between our bathymetry and our LIDAR and just basically GPS on top of a golf cart, we basically can develop a uh, nice DEM of the island at a uh, half meter resolution. Uh, we couldn't map certain areas because of classified materials, and the radars kill us, kill people when they actually, honestly, God, they spin these lights. And they, everyone has to evacuate because basically the radiation is so high so that they can track things supposedly like the size of a shoebox 20,000 miles in space. Pretty impressive. Um, so the prescribed climate change scenarios, um, we had looked at two climate change scenarios, so RCP 4.5 and 8.5. If you don't know much about the IPC scenarios, just think of this. 4.5 is where we, by the time we hit 2050, we start to reduce emissions. RCP 8.5 is just unabated emissions, just nonstop growth or business as usual scenario. And so again, those come from the IPCC AR5 scenarios, or AR5 group. Sea level rise, we actually looked at three different scenarios. So we matched the RCP 4.5 and 8.5. But knowing the new data coming out of the Antarctic, we added uh, ice sheet collapse. This is based on a lot of the work done by Bob Kopp and others, um, just saying that, hey, it might be worse. <laughs> And so when these, you know, maybe you can have a little error if you're here in central California and high sea cliffs, but these low areas, you know, we, we had to include this. And so these numbers were taken basically directly out of Department of Defense's CARSWIG uh, database, which was funded by S Department of Defense CERDIP. Okay, so now we have to get from climate down to waves, down to flooding and islands. So first thing is we're out here in the Western Pacific. This is the land of giant typhoons. And this shows a nice picture of three typhoons cranking up. Um, and so here actually shows a map of the shading, shows the average, the density or frequency of hurricanes in the area, obvious, or typhoons, obviously, the, you know, all those ones that slam into Taiwan and the Philippines. Out here in the Marshall Islands is a lot where there's primarily nucleate. And so they get them a lot less frequent and a lot less intense, usually what would be like a cap one at most, but usually just primarily tropical storms. So now what we're showing is a distribution or the probability of occurrence for the annual number of storms. The gray is the observation over the historical record. The blue is the simulation of the historical period. So you see basically the gray and the blue look very similar, which is one of the great things if you can't model the past, you never feel comfortable about modeling the future. So it's nice that we simulate this. And then the future simulations with the IPCC scenarios, so you're having global structure dynamically downscale in the model. What we see is a drastic decrease in typhoons in this area. That's not meaning all typhoons disappear, just m much fewer. The ones that are there are going to be as strong, if not stronger. What if I'm not showing you here, but what it shows is that area of nucleation slides further west. And that's why it decreases in this area. And so what does that mean for the islands? Well, at least during the summer cyclone season, you have smaller waves and less rainfall. So 
in terms of high latitude storm waves, what we did is a uh, grad student at UCSC, James Shope, we took the same global climate change models and we ran Wave Watch 3. And so um, what we did then is then we can look at their patterns. And what you see is here in the Marshall Islands, the winter storm waves, and we see the same thing here in California, is the big North Pacific swell that tracks across the North Pacific, slams into us, Oregon, and Washington. Those are projected to decrease. The storm intensities are projected to decrease with global warming. However, what we see is the summer swell, which comes up from the south, is supposed to increase. This is an intensification of storms swinging around Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. And again, we see the same thing here from dynamically downscaled model projections for California. Same thing. Decreased North Pacific winter swell, increased summer southern swell. So what that means, we're going to have smaller waves in the winter, which are the big ones that usually over cause overwash, and slightly larger in summer. So now that we get an idea of how the rainfall and waves are going to be doing, how they interact with the reef and shoreline. So reefs have usually this steep outer slope, this thing called the reef crest where the waves break, and, and a reef flat coming up to the shoreline. And so what we see is very kind of interesting. It's out here in the open ocean, we see waves with periods on the order of you know, 5 to 15 seconds. And we call that the incident band. So these are just different places offshore on the fore reef, the outer reef flat, the middle reef flat, the inner reef flat. And so out on the open ocean, we see our typical what we see out here, you know, waves at these frequencies of 15 to 20 seconds. However, once it hit, they break here on the reef, they redistribute energy into these longer and longer periods or lower and lower frequencies, these infragravity and very low frequency waves. So that by the shoreline, actually these, all the wave energies in these lower frequencies. Now, it's a really interesting thing because if you know about how waves come in sets, well, bigger waves break further offshore, smaller waves break closer, and so that break point kind of modulates back and forth, and that kind of is what pumps energy into these lower frequencies. Why this matters is because run-up is a function of two things, height and period. You see, now your period is jumping by an order of magnitude or two. So the amount of run-up or flooding of the coastline, now that its energy is pumped into these very low frequencies, is much more effective at coastal flooding. And you see that here. So here you see these five-second waves offshore. You see a group of waves here and a group of waves here. These are these infragravity waves, pulses of them coming across. So question, can we model it? Well, what we use is Deltari's X-Beach model, which is a non-hydrostatic storm wave model developed for flooding uh, during hurricanes on the East Coast. And so what you're seeing in purple is kind of those wave group envelopes. What you're seeing in blue are the individual waves. So can we, basically, can we model that? God, do not look at this plot. All this plot is showing you is that we actually make lots of measurements of water levels, setup, wave heights in both the incident and infragravity band, and these are model data comparisons. And so you collect a lot of data. You guys have on your team the people who develop the model, and they can figure it all out. And so one of the important parts of this is we need to have spatially varying roughness, and that's because of the presence of corals. They have a lot of structure. They cause a lot of friction. They absorb a lot of energy out. And we also need it spatially varying, which is good because the corals vary spatially across it. So we need super high roughness. The breaker formulations, these things are usually between 0.8 and 1.2 for sandy shorelines. So much different breaking. And we really needed not only to capture those wave groups, those infragravity waves, but the little ones riding on top of it. So Super computationally expensive, but it's the only way we could get good results. So now I'm going to show you some of these simulations. So what we're showing you here is here's our island, slightly elevated runway, nice buildings. Here's that coastal berm that's a little higher. Mean island elevation is about two meters. So what we're simulating here is a half meter of sea level rise 
with five meter waves at 15 seconds, so about 16 foot waves at 15 seconds. These predictive occur about 18 hours per month during the average winter. And so here just shows you a little, so the model, sh we can actually capture not only the wave breaking, but that water rushing across the surface, flowing over the surface, all even including losses to groundwater infiltration, and it filling and ponding up on the island. Um, that little simulation was like two weeks of computation time. <laughs> so it looks really cool like a cartoon, but it's actually a heck of a lot of work. So one of the great things, again, that this program is good at is they didn't want us just to answer the question about what matters to this base, but how can we extrapolate this out in space? So one of the great things with models you can do is you can turn them on and off, turn processes on and off. So you can isolate one process, vary that, and see what the relative effect is. So what we're showing you here is a little complicated. Um, we're looking at run-up, so from zero to six meters of run-up, and looking at different properties, sea level, wave height, wave steepness, roughness, basically like coral roughness, beach or reef slope, how steep the front of the reef is, the width of the reef, and the width of the beach. And so what was cool about this is we could explore this and say, gosh, Oh, whoops. So which are the ones, for all the places that we don't have $3 million to go study, which islands are the ones that are more susceptible? It's, well, those with narrow reefs, smooth, so good, healthy reef, good, dead, bad reef, bad, and uh, the slope. So just what happens if the reef's too steep, the, all the wave energy reflects off of it. If it's too light, it... Uh, dissipates across, but about a one in four, you get good amplification on the reef flat. So it can say now, if we're gonna look at other islands, which are the ones that we're more, more concerned about or less concerned about. So now that we got the water over the reef and onto the island, how's it gonna impact freshwater availability? So one of the cool tools we have here is at the USGS is electro, electrical resistivity. So basically we have a streamer that we send electricity underground. And what that does is it, tra it uh, transmits really well in salt water, because the salt's conductive, and poorly in fresh water. So what we can do is, under the island, is map that freshwater lens. And so what you're seeing here is this freshwater lens floating on top of the underlying seawater that's in the carbonate platform. We could test that with well data. So we can kind of look at island structure. One of the cool things about it is, you notice this line is not super flat. That's good. Heterogeneity is good. Uh, and you see it here on the north side of the island where storms hit even more attenuated. And why is that good? Because that's how islands form, right? You have a big storm and it piles up a pile of sediment. And the next storm piles up a pile of sediment. So we're actually seeing into the, the geologic structure, the interior of the island, so that we actually can make an accurate map. But it's just, if we'd seen something smooth, we'd have been like, we're missing something. We're seeing it, and we have to capture that in the model. And I'll show you that the importance of that in the model in a second. So then we developed a groundwater model. This is uh, by Steve Gingrich in our water group. So it's finite, three-dimensional groundwater model, solute transport. So what you see here is we've got our nice blue fresh water on our island, a little transitional zone, kind of like estuarine zone, and the salty seawater around it. Now, what we did is we had longer term wells during the 2008 event, so we could test, this is time and days, this is chloride content, so the 2008 overwash event, here's the real data in the wells. So they could test different permeability distributions whether you could have a homogeneous or heterogeneous. Well, it was really good. It's the only way we solved it was with the heterogeneous system, which, thank gosh, because it is one, but it makes you feel good. So then what we can do is model flooding. So here, what we show is a modeled overwash event. So now we've turned the island on its side, so ocean, lagoon, flooding over the northern part of the island, the northern quarter, and it gets in this little depression by the runway. Then, due to that heterogeneity, 
new rainfall starts to push that salinity out. And so the salinity just doesn't sink normally. There's all that weird heterogeneity, and it, so it goes down. There's convective cells in this. But what it shows you is this amount of overwash takes about 15 months to totally recover. N enough new fresh water falls on the island through rain to push that salt water out so that now this water's got a low enough chloride content to drink again. So think about that, 15 months. So remember in the future we said there's flu fewer typhoons, decreased precipitation. So in the future the recovery time is actually going to be slightly longer than 15 months. But 15 months, 15 is bigger than 12. Remember that, okay? So what we started to model then is at what point is the overwash event, so these are simulations, I'm not going to tell you when in the future yet, but your chloride, this is your potability threshold, so it's too salty. So what we're looking for is basically when the annual event is such that you can't recover from it, and it just basically then never refreshes. So we can test this in the model. So one of the biggest concerns we have about numerical modeling or modeling anything is modeling outside your realm of data. You know, like I measure things out here today, then I'm trying to predict what happens when it's 30-foot wave heights. You really don't have much confidence because you haven't captured data over the range of values. Uh, good for us scientists, horrible for the people of the Marshall Islands is in March 2014, basically 20-foot waves at 15-second periods struck the study site, and we had basically an uh, overwash event. So we actually had data to calibrate and validate all these models. We weren't just making stuff up. And remember, that's 6.9 meter waves. This is much higher than usual, or the, and then the average winter. And here shows some ground, groundwater time series. So the tides going up and down, which remember that freshwater floats on the salt water, so it goes up and down. The entire freshwater lens goes up and down. But we had this overwash event. The salinity shoots up. You see the entire groundwater came up to the surface because all of a sudden the entire thing was saturated with seawater. But so we have full data on that, both on waves, water levels, salinity structure. So what does that mean for the islands? Okay, we've got these climate change projections. Let's move forward. Well, first off, the sea level rise projections for RMI, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, is these are global numbers, half a meter, 1.5, or 2 meters. You'll notice those things aren't the same on the axis here. And why that is, is because in the Central Pacific, you've got some vertical land motion, you've got ocean circulation, and again, the ice melt. Because when the ice melts at the poles, it's not uniform. You have gravitational attraction, so you melt ice at the poles. Sea level is actually highest in the tropics, much higher. So if globally you have two meters of sea level rise, in RMI you're actually having 2.9 meters of sea level rise. So we're here, we're like, oh, maybe we can handle 60 centimeters of sea level rise. Well, that's going to be 110 centimeters out there. Okay, so what we start doing now is we start running the models. models running them for months and months. And so what we're showing here is wave-driven flooding predicted to occur once every 12 months. So this isn't the, the 20 year cyclone. This is your average winter, big winter storm. And so what we're doing is showing you the amount, the, the color is showing you the water depth over the island for different time slices moving into the future for different scenarios. So this is Reduced global emissions by mid-century. This is unabated emissions. This is unabated emissions plus ice sheet collapse. We are doing, as we move into the future, adjusting the wave heights due to the fewer typhoons. We are increasing sea level. We're actually not increasing coral degradation, though, which would cause even more flooding. So remember, 48 hours of seawater flooding about the northern quarter of the island takes 15 months to recover. Well. What we see is that amount of flooding under reduced carbon emissions is going to be the latter half of the, cent of the century. However, unabated carbon emissions, we're talking in the next few decades, and if ice sheet collapse happens, oops, sorry, we're talking about 
in the next few decades. This is like the end of my career. You know, this isn't, oh, generations, generations. These are kids running around on the islands right now. And so once these tipping points, the other thing, remember, the Marshall Islands are one of the high, where the sea level high stand was the highest. So the Marshall Islands are higher than most islands. So what does that mean? Again, reduce carbon emissions. Probably up 60 to 70 years before the annual winter storm overwashes the islands. Islands aren't going to drown. They're just going to get overwashed annually. So under 8.5, that's in about 30, 40 years. And if ice sheet collapses, like some of these most recent projections, we're talking 20 to 30 years. So where does that leave us? Well, if you have a massive GDP like they have in the Maldives, they're just going to build their way out of it. Man, engineers can build anything, but it costs money. And even in the Maldives, what they said is we can do this to the capitals and some of the other big things, but we're going to have to give up hundreds and hundreds of other islands. Well, you can do that. You can just deal with flooding. I'll tell you this, most human infrastructure doesn't do well with salt water, right? <laughs> or we can just give up and let it go, right? So again, this is just the 2014 event. Um, and thing is, again, think about things like hurricane. This is like similar hurricane impact. You just have this much water. Well, if this happens once every 20 or 30 years, maybe you can get by with it. Once it starts happening every year, I don't care if it's above and beyond fresh water, you start to destroy every piece of metal and concrete in these areas. And again, I just want to remind you, 20, 30 years, that's not some future generation, that's these kids. So what's the future? <laughs> well, uh, hey, you know, these small island nations are gonna be most impacted by this, are actually going to uh, the UN international court saying, gosh, you got, we didn't call, create most of the CO2, but we're the ones gonna be impacted. And so I think you're gonna see more and more of this, you know, this international climate litigation. And so, again, I don't think it's going to vanish behind <laughs> rising seas, but it mo no, might no longer be inhabitable. So, in conclusion, typhoons are being less frequent, bringing less rainfall. Winter storm rays are going to decrease in height, decreasing offshore wave forcing, which is a good thing. But sea level rise is going to increase those nearshore wave heights, run up in flooding. Uh, climate change, which I didn't even talk about, but when I said, hey, Remember, rough reef to smooth reef, climate change is actually going to increase the runoff and flooding, which we didn't even take into account in these projections. Uh, reduced rainfall is going to increase the aquifer recovery time. And so together, um, a lot of these islands will likely not be sustainable in the next few decades, and that's going to have geopolitical issues. So, uh, any questions? So we, um, those sea level rise projections we used in ours 
were incorporated that latitude of difference. That's Bob Cobb's work of principle. Yes? What would you say is like your biggest piece of advice for convincing the general public that this is happening, this is something we need to be aware of? Like scientists, we, we speak sometimes on a different level. Like Obama says, you know, it, it happened recently in the future. That could be any time in the last like, 500,000 years. But if you're saying this like timeline, you know, might be <coughs> Chinese have done throughout the islands. 
There's a lot of fine grained carbonate sediment in that lagoon that negative impacts. How does that compare to the mission? Yeah, maybe you just dragging from You could. Like I said, engineers can build anything. There's just costs associated with that. You have to balance that with the mission. But right now, the U.S. Department of Defense knows what it wants to do. The Department of Defense is the end all decision maker in these things. Yes, uh, can the models you develop can they be used to um, test out different uh, infrastructure scenarios and sea walls, or is that just a cruising battle infrastructure? Well, you can, but the problem is, is you're on a big block. Remember when sea level was lower, there's carbonate tower, they basically these carbonate towers, right? So you have karst topography, karst processes, rain flows on it, like the Yucatan Peninsula, it turns into a big block of Swiss cheese. Remember I showed you how um, with the tides, the fresh water lens was going up or down? So if you could build a sea wall, the sea level keeps rising up, like, I mean, that's what kind of makes me, I hate to say it, but I laugh looking at this thing. They're building this massive sea wall, but they're on a big block of Swiss cheese. They build the sea wall 50 feet high, but sea level's going to keep rising up. It's going to rise up in, this, in the island itself. And we see that, we even see that ourselves. It's just heavy rainfall, fresh water lens, and sometimes come up in these low spots. So the only way to engineer it is to actually build the entire island surface up. So like I said, the Chinese and Sprotleys and those have shown that any way to do that under ecological costs. You can engineer your way out of it. It costs a lot of money. And people are struggling over hundreds of islands right now. So it's the thought being is they're going to make cost benefit analyses. And like I said, even the Maldives, the island nation of the most atolls, as I've already said, we're going to fortify some, we're going to give up others. And I think you're going to see more and more of that. Our job as scientists is to be able to say almost triage, like, oof. <laughs> these are the ones. These are the ones we need to worry about in the near term. These are the long term. Maybe those we don't work. You know, it's basically prioritize whatever it is, whatever kind of action is decided. That's our job to try to point to them which ones need to be dealt with first. To do it in a, in a smart manner. I forgot what when, when was the first. When do you think the first nation will be built? Well, we're just saying when these average kind of islands with. Uh, these things is within potentially 20, 30 years. But that's assuming these, again, it's all assuming climate change projections. Tomorrow we can stop all emissions and figure out how to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. So it's all based on these projections. And I'll be clear about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, again, our science is to save dollars and lives, to provide guidance. And I, I mean, that, I'm proud of this work because we are going to hopefully do that. And we give people a voice. You're talking about the people like, hey, now it's not just waving some hand in the air. Now there's good data out there on which to hopefully make more important decisions. Yeah, but what I'm not talking about is that uh, people who are not that is that uh, we, you know, the evidence is it's more than out there. We will know. Uh, the problem is that there's great lots of the evidence, and there's you know, that's the way people start to think. So the only answer to this is to change our society and address the you know, issue of all this and really curve. And you showed again how even a relatively small change, because both, you know, due to the four point five scenario it doesn't mean that it's all, you know, uh, using cars that we a lot, we just start you know, reducing our emissions and actually curb them in the same which is totally feasible. Mm -hmm. So it has a, a, a very large impact. I mean, we, we know that most of our other things, the classification and so forth. So it really is a minimal effort, really. That's what we're And uh, I mean, that's pretty. Yeah, I mean, you're basically almost doubling the amount of time you have. Huh. Which means but that. But the thing scary to me is how little sea level rise you need to have. And so that says it's not something you kick the can down the road anymore. 
these are decisions that need to be made now. The next thing here is you have a bunch of educated people that obviously are mostly have environmental concerns. The thing is, it's not my job. I'm the older guy. No one listens to me anymore. It's you guys to get out there and talk to your friends because you're the largest block of people who don't vote by a It's, you know, like what was the last, the last uh, election was determined by how many people? Less than a million? How many, what percent of the American population voted? See, three, 34 percent? Mm -hmm. Not a lot to make a big difference. So can I ask you, I mean, to me, one of the most, I mean, this is a great, this is a really great study, and one of the most surprising things is the tipping point about, you know, the freshwater story. It's really, it's pretty scary, too, because, uh, you know, what you're seeing basically is there's a memory effect. Eventually, once, you know, the freshwater landscape push it up over and over, eventually it doesn't recharge. You know? So that's really something that might happen uh, within years. I mean, we're not talking about you know, and was it, were you surprised to find that out? Because it, I was actually really surprised. I honestly, I mean, I, you know, I knew about the, the, you know, the, you know, how the chart works and how, you know, how, how the plants get pushed out and eventually. But what you're saying is that there's a memory effect. Eventually, there's not enough time between events to the chart. It's, that's really very kind of one message that I think it should probably come out because, you know, I think it's really no water, no life. Yeah, right. and that's what was really interesting. So again, this motivation for this was this 2008 overwashed event. Overwashed about half the populated islands. Just this crazy North Pacific storm that kind of sat and rolled, well, came off Japan, came back and rolled around for a bit, and threw these big waves down. I mean, much bigger than we ever modeled here. These were one of a 20 year event. But what was interesting was that loss of fresh water. They actually had to clean out oil tankers Build them up with water, fresh water, take them out there because they lost their fresh water resources. Um, you know, that bottle of water or something like that. But I mean, it was at the volume that they had to create tankers out. And so that's where it's kind of like, ooh, you know, it's the, what is it, the law of twos or whatever? You can go two days, two weeks without food, but only two days without water. So, like that. And again, hey, you're fine. Maybe, maybe we, we build these out, right? But and so you that can push some of these back. But you know, all of a sudden, if you start getting like how much of the island is overwashed with salt water, you know, again, salt water doesn't do good things to metal and concrete. So okay, maybe you can get by with desal and bottled water for a bit. But just when you start to put, you know, centimeters or decimeters of salt water on islands once a year. And again, that's once a year. So what you can think of is this is happening once a year, maybe once every five years you get something that's much bigger than that, right? So, you know, that tricky point, theoretically, we could be very, we could be on the conservative side. Okay, well, thank you so much for the